Sonic Speaks. And welcome to the final episode of Sonic Speaks for this season. I'm Jack Ward. As you may well know, tonight is part two of my essay on the audio story, first broadcast in the audio drama production podcast. I hope you enjoy. I got the idea from listening to the ADPP and also reading the book Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. In it, Mr. McCloud has a great picture identifying all the various parts of where comic art fits. I thought about it for a while and came up with this shape to explore our favorite medium, audio drama. So without further ado, here's part two. And have a great summer. My Unified Theory of the Audio Story, part two. How is an audio story represented? Is there a way to best articulate all the kinds of stories you can have in audio? I'm Jack Ward from the Sonic Society. Last time I postulated that there are three corners of the audio story triangle. Audio drama based on scripted plays, audio narrative based on prose or novel form, and experimental audio that takes all kinds of forms, not the least of which are sketches and improvisational audio. We identified that every audio drama production company, writers and producers have neighborhoods or plotted areas that we can triangulate, as it were. And just being able to visualize that brings us into a deeper understanding of the character of the groups of stories or a company. And just being able to visualize that brings us to a deeper understanding of the character of a group of stories or a company and the style of the writer or writers involved. But as much as I love this model, it's not complete. Although it covers all the various sources of audio stories, it's kind of flat because it doesn't look at how a story is executed. So I'm standing right here in the very center of our massive audio triangle, exactly between drama, narrative, and experimental to bring some depth to the story. So our middle portion is growing, higher and higher until it reaches its own peak. Our audio triangle has become an audio pyramid. Because this third dimensional place, this extra fourth part, I like to label intimate. Now I understand that labels are problematic and once we rise above everything, we're in a precarious position of falling. I'm, I'm not trying to say that one kind of audio story connects with people and another does not. What I'm saying is, the higher you are in intimacy with the listener, the less you need to build an audio world around them and the more you require the listener to construct the landscape in their own heads. Now, I know that I depicted the end point of narrative last time as being that lone voice with no sound effects or music, but that was really to try to help you better picture the differences between script and prose, drama and narrative. There really doesn't need to be sound effects or music in drama either. When I was a kid, there was a show on television called Story Theater in which actors like Alan Alda got together in no costumes with no props and no sound effects and acted out fairy tales. This was one of the most intimate portraits of story because watching, you had to imagine, without prompting, the actors riding horses, the trolls and the bridges they lived under. So much is created by the viewer or the listener that there is, that there's almost a direct line from the writer through the voice of the actor to the audience. There's nearly no intermediary in the way. It is, for lack of a better word, intimate. One of the key elements of the audio story is that it is the most intimate of mediums. The cinema and television and even a stage play you witness from a distance. And it takes incredible art to bridge that gulf between performance and audience to erase that distance and be immersed in the experience. 
But audio is best experienced intimately, by which I mean that the images are drawn straight from your imagination. The sounds strike up the story inside your head, and the listener is, in a real way, a co-creator, filling in the elements of the set, sound effects, and atmosphere with color, texture, and lighting. Even the characters, although hinted at by their voices and the description in the story, emerge entirely from the listener's mind. That is why closure is so effective in art, because it allows the experiencer to complete the message. In my play One by One, sound effects and dialogue describes the beginning of a great plague that'll wipe out all of Halifax. Line three. Hello, Eva. Hello. This is Dan from Classic Bubbly. Am Are you... I on the air? Yes, yes, you're on the air right now. You're, you're calling from downtown? Yes, I'm here on Market Street. I just left the wooden monkey with my boyfriend. Hey, Brian, where are you going? Eva? Eva, what's going on? Well, we're being kept back right now. We were told originally not to leave the restaurant, but many people, they didn't want to stick around, and they didn't see any reason. They, they... Told you not to leave the restaurant? Who told you that, Eva? Police, I guess. I mean, they identified themselves as police, but I didn't see a badge. They just walked in, but weren't wearing any uniforms. Black trench coats and suits. They flashed their wallets. What exactly did they say? Ryan, where are you going? Eva? Eva, can you hear me? Dan, I I have to go. My boyfriend, he's, he's run off. I have to go find him. Eva, stay on the line, please. Brian! Eva! No, you can't get through there! Eva! Eva! Uh, it looks like we've lost Eva, folks. Uh, Katie and I will try to get her back. In the meantime, uh, back to the hands and old-time Radio Halloween. It's the acting of Tanya Malevich that sells the growing fear of the crowd. As her character keeps calling out for her boyfriend and then running away down the street, it just provides enough of the scene for the listener to understand and complete the picture. The more intimate the portrayal of the story, the fewer clues the story provides. Take for example this clip from the now legendary, did we just dream this series or what? Midnight Radio Theater by Billy Sinise. I think we're gonna live happily ever after. Do you think we're gonna be punished? What, by God? Yeah, God, or whatever. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, what we did is what millions of people all over the world do every day. Are all of them going to be punished? Maybe they already are. Maybe it's like happening in small ways, like having more bad days than most, or just... Or general bad luck. It could be big stuff too. It could happen so far from the incident that you, you wouldn't even know it, like cancer when you're 50 for something you did when you were in your early 30s. I mean, no one, no one thinks to blame cancer on moral choices that we make, but what if that person really had it coming? What if, what if she was a cheater like us? Someone who is responsible for breaking up a family. So at the time that she got away with it, 20 years later, she's punished. I was in an unhappy marriage. You were in an unhappy relationship as well. I mean, now we have a better chance at this than we ever did before. This is a good thing. My situation was different. I mean, you, you made, you two made a commitment. You, know, you had a child together. Didn't you have a responsibility to at least make an effort to get past it? Well, what makes you think we didn't? Well, you could have at least separated before sleeping with me. 
Because that's what really broke her heart open. Jesus Christ, woman. Is this part of the punishment? Did you feel the simple nature of that scene? It's intimate. There's not a lot provided or needed to paint a rich picture of the characters, their relationship, and the world that surrounds them. It is in the execution of this scene that brings closure from the minds of the listener. Here's another quick example. Biological Clock from Ira Gamerman from the Truth Podcast. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Look at that. He, he must you know what it means. hundreds of couples. It needs another space right in the center for another <laughs> Polaroid for the baby that is going to come out of you. Oh, oh. One second. Turn that off. I can't. It's Putin. Oh. <laughs> I swear to God, I think he's flirting with me on these texts. Oh, gosh, I hope so. I just need to get back to him right now. I'm, I am this close to organizing a concert to support the Chechen rebels at this point. This guy texts you way too much. Well, that's why you would support them. I support all rebels. <laughs> We should compile these stories for our future child. Yes. Daddy, tell me another story. Because <laughs> he's going to be an 1800s British <laughs> child. Tell me another story, oh, where Mommy. Is this tell me about when Vladimir Putin I, trying to pick you up. Are we putting eggs in baskets? I'll, if I, if I just there want... are some eggs <laughs> in a basket, I will You'll fertilize I will, them. I will fertilize them. <laughs> I'll... I can too. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry to keep you both waiting. Well, that's totally fine. That happens. I have bad news. Well, both of these clips are happening in a kind of modern day setting. They don't have to be. However, it could be fair to say that the more removed you are from the present setting, the more apt your producer and audio engineer will need to provide clues to better paint the soundscape for the listener. It would be too simple to suggest that our peak of the audio story pyramid intimate requires little or no sound effects to achieve. I don't think the answer is that you just eliminate your sound effects to create intimacy in your audio story. But there is a sense of purity that comes with shaving off everything that's not needed to tell the story and keep the narrative as clean and clear as possible. Intimate. This style was found in a lot of old-time radio shows because sound effects were live and unless run by a team of people were executed by a single special effects artist. This was the guy, or gal, who needed to get rid of the high heeled shoes in time to break open the door before rendering a thunderstrike in the air. Starkly produced and executed, audio drama demands a lot of their listeners. But it also provides, in a strange way, a very rich soundscape because it lets the listener create it themselves. But what if your goal is to create a rich and textured soundscape for your listeners? That sound you're hearing below us is our pyramid morphing one last time. We may have one point going up where we're standing now, but down below, the base of the pyramid is jutting outwards into its final point. This transforms our pyramid structure into an octahedron, or for the nerdy among us, an eight-sided die. On all eight facets, we connect the three points in the middle of drama, narrative, and experimental with the final north and south points of the audio story being intimate and dynamic. What is dynamic in our now fully three-dimensional audio world? Dynamically executed audio stories represent the cinematic and are often described, unfairly I think, as the modern day audio drama sensibility. Dynamic audio stories can include multi-layered sound effects representing what I call the every blade of grass group. Dynamic audio stories cue in the listener by giving much more texture to scenes. Listeners don't need to work as hard to get into the story. You don't have to imagine the sound of the speeding freight car or the steam-powered lightning gun. The dynamic story has it produced for you. Similarly, when a story is executed dynamically, expect to have characters' positions in the audio to be defined and deliberate. Dynamic audio is especially concerned with perspective and using music to set mood and tone. When Dirk Maggs tells you that he wants audio drama to be cinematic, just like the movies, you can be certain it's not an accident that his productions are robustly dynamic. 
Some other dynamic groups include Epic Audio, Oral Stage Studios, Final Rune Productions, Darker Projects, Wayland Productions, and of course, again, in Broken Sea Audio when either Stevie Farnaby or Bill Hallway get behind the wheel. Like this scene from Escape from New York. Shit, walkie, talkie. Need to get a new one. Like we ever get new equipment around here. Base control, this is Gotham 4, North Bay, Station 17. I have an escape in progress. An object in mid bay moving towards the wall. Copy that, Gotham 4. Eagle 2, did you copy that? Over. I copy base control 1. Over. Intercept and neutralize. Over. Intercept and neutralize. I copy base control 1. Eagle 2, out. Copy that, Eagle 2. Good hunting. Dynamic audio stories can instantly transport listeners to new worlds with 3D holographic sound structures and a deep understanding of how to use a lot of sound in ways that avoids becoming a cloud of noise, but instead a rich environment. You might think of it this way. An intimate execution of an audio story is like a book. A dynamic execution of an audio story is a film experience in sound. Again, it's no accident that dynamic producers often describe their radio drama as audio movies. So now, you can consider where in this diamond-shaped octahedron of audio your favorite stories lie. Do dynamic and intimate executions of audio stories say something of the writers and production companies who use them? Absolutely. Would someone who grew up with the Spartan use of sound effects and perspective in old-time radio, or with a deep appreciation for community theater, have a difficulty appreciating dynamic more than intimate audio? Similarly, would someone who considers themselves a visual learner and a lover of movies find the intimate portrayal of an audio drama bland and uninteresting? In the 10 years of the Sonic Society, there's been nearly 150 contributors of audio shows, and most of those in the last five. Can you imagine where they would all fit on those eight sides? Where would you place Campfire Theater or Dick Dynamo? Certainly many audio production companies have multiple places on the map, but wouldn't that information also find them located a little closer towards the region of experimental? Icebox Radio, for example, depending upon whether they're presenting a live or studio production or a holiday or a series show, they could certainly have different places on our octahedron. And knowing Jeffrey Adams, that's just how he likes it. Same with companies such as Misfits, Pendant, and Gypsy, who are all cooperative groups with varying genres and concepts. Still others like Harry Strange, Desert Gems, The Once and Future Nerd, Wormwood, Bells in the Bat Free, Kung Fu Action Theater, and Dr. Floyd, through genre or single series, would have clear positions on our eight-sided world. And that's it. All the points of the audio story compass. All aspects of story representation and execution form together. The only question that remains is this. Where do you like to make your story? And who do you want to listen to it? I'm Jack Ward. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.